Hello everybody. Our lecture is about paralysis of the larynx. First, we shall start by the functions of the larynx. The functions of the larynx in order of importance are first, it the protection, then respiration, phonation, and chest fixation. The nerve supply of the larynx. The nerve supply of the larynx goes via the superior laryngeal nerve, which gives motor supply for the cricothyroid muscle and sensor supply for the mucous membrane above the level of the vocal cords. The recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies motor for all muscles of the larynx except the cricothyroid muscle and sensory to the mucous membrane below the level of the vocal cords. So, recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies all laryngeal muscles except the cricothyroid muscle, while the cricothyroid is only supplied by superior laryngeal nerve. This picture shows the course of recurrent laryngeal nerve. The course of recurrent laryngeal nerve varies according to the side. The left recurrent laryngeal nerve have longer course. It goes downwards to make an arch around, uh, to make it a turn around the arch of aorta in the chest. This means that lesions usually of the recurrent laryngeal nerve may occur in the chest, while lesions of the uh, on the left side, while on the right side the recurrent laryngeal nerve affection if, uh, occurs only if there is a problem in the neck. Okay, so. If there is a, a paralysis of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, I have to put the problems in the chest in the differential diagnosis. Okay, since the right recurrent laryngeal nerve is make its turn in the neck, so its course is shorter and its lesion means that there is a problem only in the neck, unlike the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. There are, the movement of the vocal cords are adduction and abduction. The adduction is important for phonation, while abduction is important for inspiration. This picture shows the abduction of the vocal cords, means that the vocal cords goes away from each other, allow air to enter during the inspiration. This picture, on the other hand, shows the abduction of the vocal cords which allow to make voice make phonation. The muscle action on the vocal cords. Since we said that we have abduction and adduction movement of the vocal cords, so every movement is produced by specific muscles. If we start by abduction, the only abductor of the vocal cord is the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. It's called the muscle of the life, since it is the only abductor of vocal cord, the only muscle that opens the vocal cords, allowing for inspiration. So, this is muscle. This muscle is the most important muscle in human. Okay, it's called the muscle of the life, since it maintains the abduction position of the vocal cords, allowing for inspiration. Adduction, on the other hand, is produced by very different muscles, including the lateral cricoarytenoid, the interarytenoids, which include transverse arytenoid and oblique arytenoids, and the thyroarytenoid muscle. Also, we have what's called tensor muscles. The tensor muscles are important since they increase the pitch of the voice by increasing the tension of the vocal cords. They are divided into external tensor, which is the cricothyroid muscle, and an internal tensor, which is the vocalis muscle. Also, vocalis muscle is the medial fibers of thyroarytenoid.
This picture shows the mode of action of the different muscles of the vocal cords. Also, this picture shows the different types of vocal cord paralysis, whether unilateral or bilateral, whether abductor or adductor, affection of respiration or phonation. If we start by combined recurrent laryngeal and superior laryngeal nerve palsy, which is unilateral, means that the cord will be paralyzed in cadaveric position, producing hoarseness of voice, glottic incompetence, hoarseness aspiration of liquids, ineffective cough, and partial anesthesia of laryngeal sand aspiration. Combined recurrent and superior laryngeal nerve bilateral paralysis these two paralysis of vocal cords in, a, in cadaveric position, producing aphonia, glottic incompetence leading to aspiration, ineffective cough, producing retention of secretion in the chest, also anesthesia of the larynx and aspiration. This picture shows the difference between phonation and inspiration. This is the, the photo on your left hand shows the closed position, while the photo on the right hand shows the open position. Now we go to a very important issue, which is the positions of the vocal cord. First, we have what's called the medium position. This is important for phonation. We have the paramedian position in which we have 3 mm glottic shank. The next position is the intermediate position or cadaveric position, which is in which there is 8 mm glottic shank. Then we have the gentle abduction position in which we have 14 mm glottic shank. This, this position is produced during quiet respiration. And the, finally, we have what's called the full abduction position in which we have an 18 millimeter glottic shank and this shank is important for the respiration now we go to some theories of the vocal cord biases first we have to know what's called the simmons law simmons law states that nerve fibers arranged in the recurrent laryngeal nerve the abductor fibers are externally arranged while the adductor fibers are internally arranged. Recently, this law is considered incorrect. And position of the vocal cords after paralysis depends upon the weight of the paralyzed muscle, which pulls it medially and downwards into the median or the paramedian position. The position of the vocal cords according to Simon's law, partial recurrent laryngeal nerve leads to abductor paralysis leading to adduction in the median position. Complete recurrent laryngeal nerve leads to both abduction and adduction paralysis, leading to vocal cord shifted laterally to becoming the paramedian position. Combined recurrent laryngeal nerve and superior laryngeal nerve leading to the tensile muscles of the cords are also paralyzed. paralyzed and the cords will shift more laterally to become in the cadaveric position. The conclusions, regardless of the type of paralysis, it is difficult to predict the permanent paralysis of the vocal cords because of the following points. First, continued function of the remaining muscle. Muscle fibrosis. The tone of autonomic nervous system. 
the cricoarytenoid joint fibrosis and the weight of the paralyzed muscle. Now we have to go to one of the very important aspects of this lecture. What are the causes of paralysis of the larynge or of the laryngeal muscles? Actually, we have to, it's very important to know what is the cause because you are faced with a patient that have a vocal cord paralysis. You diagnose it as vocal cord paralysis. It's important to know what is the cause because the cause varies completely between the right and left side and it may extend or involve different parts of the human uh, systems. First, we may have cortical lesions. This will lead to extensive and bilateral lesions or caused by extensive and bilateral lesions. We have bulbar lesions, meaning nuclear lesions, including vascular, like hemorrhage or thrombosis, tumors, poliomyelitis, diphtheria, vagus or recurrent laryngeal nerve. Vagus or recurrent laryngeal nerve may be injured at the base of the skull in the neck and in the thorax and actually if there is a lesion in the thorax it will affect the left recurrent laryngeal nerve since we said that the left recurrent laryngeal nerve have a longer course in the in, 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 in reaching the chest lesion at the base of the skull may be fracture base of the skull basal meningitis nasopharyngeal malignant tumors Lesion in the neck, for example, thyroidectomy or thyroid malignancy, malignant lymph nodes, hypopharyngeal cancer, cancer esophagus, and pharyngeal pouch, parapharyngeal abscess or malignancy. Lesion in the thorax, and also it will, as we said, it will affect the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. For example, malignant mediastinal lymph node Oesophagus and bronchogenic carcinoma, aortic aneurysm and dilated left atrium, surgery of the heart, lung, and oesophagus, for example, ligation of beta and ductus arteriosus. Also, we may have peripheral neurites, for example, diphtheria and influenza. And finally, we have an idiopathic cause in 25% of the causes leading to unilateral paralysis. It's important to know that, to say, to say that this, the cause of, of this paralysis is idiopathic, you have to exclude all other causes, okay? So idiopathic means that there is no other cause detected. So it is, this diagnosis is diagnosis of exclusion. Severe laryngeal nerve paralysis is most commonly secondary to thyroidectomy, supraglottic laryngectomy, and radical neck dissection. The treatment, if it is unilateral, no treatment. If it is bilateral, you have to assure the patient till compensation occurs. The clinical picture of the superior laryngeal nerve paralysis depends on the branch. If it affects the internal branch, this will lead least to loss of supraglottic sensation, leading to aspiration problems and recurrent choking attacks. But if it affects the external branch, it will lead to paralysis of the cricothyroid muscle, leading to weak monotonic speech, in which the raising speech is impossible. We have different tests for detection or diagnosis of superior laryngeal nerve paralysis. First is the Gottman's test. Gottman's test means frontal pressure of the thyroid cartilage in the normal subject lowered the voice while lateral pressure raises the voice. With the paralysis of the cricothyroid muscle, the opposite is true. Also, electroneuronography is helpful in diagnosis of the superior laryngeal nerve paralysis. 
Unilateral vocal cord paralysis. The symptoms depend on whether abductor paralysis or adductor paralysis. Unilateral abductor paralysis will produce stridor in exertion, while unilateral adductor paralysis will produce hoarseness and aspiration. The symptoms usually improve within six months due to compensation of the mobile vocal cord by crossing the midline to meet the paralyzed cord during phonation. The signs of unilateral vocal cord paralysis The vocal cord will be paralyzed in the median position in case of abductor paralysis or in the intermediate cadaveric position in case of adductor paralysis. Treatment of unilateral vocal cord paralysis First is the treatment of the cords Observation Speech therapy Medialization of the paralyzed cord in the persistence of symptoms after 6 months By Microangiosurgery, Teflon or collagen injection lateral to the vocal cord External thyroblasty with insertion of silastic block between the thyroid lamina and the vocal cord. Right recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis. The photo on the right on your right hand shows the right cord paralysis after compensation, while the photo on your left hand shows the right cord paralysis during Finish. This photo showed the right cord paralysis during inspiration. Bilateral vocal cord paralysis First we start by bilateral abductor paralysis The symptoms There will be stridor With no hoarseness But we have what's called the voice tires easily Signs Both vocal cords are paralyzed In the median or the paramedian position This will lead to narrow glottic shank This picture shows bilateral abductor paralysis. The treatment of bilateral abductor paralysis first is the treatment of the cords. Then we have to do surgical widening of the glottis to improve the airway, but this will be on the expense of the voice. This can be done by aritonidectomy and posterior cordectomy using either laser or microlangial surgery or arytenoidectomy and cordobexy which is external for IA lateralization of the vocal cords by what's called Woodman's operation sometimes permanent tracheostomy with speaking valve may be performed the second type of bilateral paralysis is the bilateral adductor paralysis First, we start by symptoms. There will be aphonia, aspiration, choking, and cough due to incompetent larynx and insensitive supraglottis, leading to chest infection, which may be fatal. Signs there will be paralysis of the vocal cord. Both vocal cords will be paralyzed in the intermediate or cadaveric position. Treatment of bilateral abductor paralysis First is the treatment of the cause Sometimes we can do tracheostomy with cuffed tube Also, there is an operation which is called laryngeal closure Which is 
the other name is epiglottopexy or glottic closure and it's combined with tracheostomy. Also, in some cases, severe cases with failure of the previous treatment, we can do or we have to do total laryngectomy. And this picture shows the bilateral adductor paralysis. Thank you very much for your listening.